look for it, find it, make it your own. It's the Get Thrifty Podcast. Welcome to the show. You have discovered the Get Thrifty Podcast brought to you by ARC Thrift Stores right here in colorful Colorado. ARC Thrift Stores is a nonprofit thrift store chain. And if you're in Colorado or visiting us, please check out one of our 35 Front Range and Western Slope locations. You will not be disappointed. I am your host, Maggie Civic, and we are all about sharing everything that has to do with shopping secondhand. So if you're part of our unique thrift culture, please contact us. We would love to promote your businesses, your social channels, and share your stories and advice with all of our listeners. As always, you can find us on Instagram at ARC Thrift. Send us a DM and let's chat. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lizbeth to the show. Very excited. Lizbeth Lyons Black, aka the Pick and Pixie, love the name, held her first solo yard sale at age nine, selling toys from a card table on the front lawn in order to buy new toys. Love it. Since then, she's resold clothing, bags, accessories, and now focuses primarily on reselling antiques and vintage art and home decor picked at estate sales, auctions, and thrift stores. She is a style agnostic and loves peddling and educating others about bygone treasures from mid-century modern to grand millennial. We're going to ask about that. We've only talked about that once on the pod to farmhouse and everything in between. Lizbeth is based in the nation's capital, where she works as a government relations professional four days a week, with Fridays off to hit the estate sales, of course. Lizbeth has been quoted in Worth magazine and regularly creates original social media content for her 23,000 plus Instagram and Facebook followers. Lizbeth, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Maggie. Really excited to be here with you today. We're going to have a lot of fun. As always, I like to start off with how you found this world, but let's start first with your social handles, how people can find you online. Oh, great. Yes. Yeah. So um, I am at that pickin pixie. So um, T-H-A-T P-I-C-K-I-N pixie, P-I-X-I-E, that pickin pixie. It was um, probably about 10 years ago in uh, the last major sweltering heat wave in DC that I uh, had all my hair chopped off into a pixie cut. (laughs) And um, I've, uh, that uh, when all the stars were doing it. So it was very trendy and I don't know that it's trendy anymore, but it's, but it suits you. It's perfect. It's a whole persona. Super easy to maintain. And so I've kept my short, short pixie cut and that led to the name um, at that Pick and Pixie. Perfect. And I'm on Poshmark that way, Instagram, Facebook, and even eBay. Okay. And we're going to ask about all the places you sell. But first, let's get a rundown of like your DNA. How did you find this secondhand world? What's your backstory? Well, the backstory is, a, um, and I'm I'm laughing because I do re- very clearly remember my first yard sale um, at age, I think, nine or 10, um, selling toys to buy new toys. And then as I became a working professional in my 20s, it was like, let's sell clothes to buy new clothes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so my toys, uh, definition of toys changed from, you know, games and stuffed animals to bags and shoes. Um, So I got really into Poshmark, gosh, I don't know, probably 10 years ago. Oh, wow. So you were an early adopter of that. I've done Poshmark for a long, long time. Um, Whether it was my own clothes, I have a niece and nephew who are now um, in middle school. And when they were babies, I I was, I don't have my own children. So I was the fun aunt who liked to spoil them and spend lots of money on, on their clothes. And then I would quickly recycle them on Poshmark. Mm -hmm. So I've always been a posher um, when it comes to clothing. I actually, before COVID started um, a business that didn't go because as a lot of people know, I'm not ashamed to say I started a a business that didn't work out. It happens. It happens. And it didn't work out for a variety of reasons, um, partly because I felt like it was um, way too much time and effort for the uh, revenue I was getting, but uh, the idea, um, and my website was at that, uh, the fairy posh mother, because I had so many people that would, so many friends that would say, I have all this clothes and I know you do Poshmark and how do I do it? And it was kind of hard to keep explaining it over and over again. So I thought I'll just kind of charge people and I will do it for them. So I started with a few clients and I would go literally like pick up all their stuff, bring it to my place, photograph it, 
Um, and basically I was kind of like my own consignment shop. So yeah. I would do 50, 50 split with them. Again, the, the math didn't really work in my favor, but, um, it definitely helped me, um, learn a little more about the business side of apps and selling platforms that I hadn't paid attention to when I was just kind of casually poshing, you know, children's clothing or, or a purse here and there to buy a new purse. So it really, um, I really started investigating at that point, different platforms and um, was still kind of a hobbyist. And then I took like COVID, I feel like a lot of people, you know, COVID is an inflection point in my career for sure. Um, I had been in the same career with the same employer for over 15 years. And during COVID, um, a few things happened. <laughs> I uh, met my husband online um, and had to like Zoom date during the pandemic while we were in two different locations. Um, so I took a sabbatical from my day job. I decided to take a big leap and I moved to the Middle East um, where, my, cool. where my now spouse was um I, I was not engaged. I moved to the Middle East um, and got engaged five days later, I should say. Um, but That's incredible. My, my husband is in the mil or was in the military. He was on his final deployment in um, the UAE uh, in the capital at Abu Dhabi. So I took a sabbatical. I moved to the Middle East. And for the first time since college, I had like three months where I literally didn't have to work. <laughs> You know, and my sabbatical was, it was unpaid, but it was my time. Yeah. And I was really allowed to explore kind of what I might want my work life to look like mm. uh, going forward, you know, post sabbatical. Um, and so what ended up happening was I did go back to my employer, um, but in a slightly different role, a little less intense than it had been in four days a week instead of five and fully remote instead of in an office. So mm -hmm. like a lot of people, I kind of had a, a work balance, you know, life balance culture shift during COVID. Um, and that really kind of led me to look at reselling and thrifting um, as kind of a, a hobbyist slash career slash maybe something I could parlay into um, a part-time job as I ease toward maybe retirement. Retirement, so, yes. I mean, I'm 53. And so, um, you know, I do think about those things at the same time, retirement's a way off for me, but you know, it allowed me to really, I, I like to say, have a little creative relief and mm -hmm. figure out what that looked like. And in the UAE, um, we were in Abu Dhabi, which is the capital and about 90 minutes from Dubai, which is like the crazy excess retail capital of the yeah, world. Yeah. Right. Um, there was really no resell culture, reselling yeah. culture there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Emirati princesses really don't need to go on Poshmark and sell <laughs> a bag to buy another bag. Probably not. <laughs> uh, so I uh, that that didn't happen for me there. Now I will say they do have a few sites. There's a site over there called Do Bizzle that's like their version of Poshmark. Uh, that's I cool. I did go on there. I set up an account, but you know, it wasn't really uh, a robust marketplace. I met some Danish women who were also expats and the Scandies are so great with sustainability and recycling. And a couple of these Danish women put together a clothing exchange. And I participated in that where we all brought 10 pieces and then took that's 10 awful. pieces. I was um, getting married over there. So I actually was able to um, source the white kind of Pashmina shawl that I wore for my wedding at this exchange, um, which was exciting. So I tried to do a little bit there, um, but it really wasn't, you know, I really couldn't do what I needed to do over there. And so I started looking on Instagram and I just kind of by chance found one of my mentors on Instagram and that's Kelly Gunn with at um she's part-time pickers. And I just kind of became a little bit of a fangirl and started following Kelly. And amazingly, one, I guess because I probably stalked her so much, um, she reached out to a few people who were her stalkers probably and said if I were to put together a master class in how to become a reseller 
online, would you be interested so in taking cool. it? Yeah. And so there were probably about 12 of us who ended up being kind of her first class of alums. Um, and we did the master class. She no longer does the master class, but she does do one on one consulting. And so um, she's, you know, a, she does offer that as a model. But that's really where I got serious about. Um, the fact that it was more, this could be more than just walking through the thrift and finding some things and thinking, oh, I'll pop this on Poshmark and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, that there was really more strategy behind it. If you wanted to build kind of a sustainable business model, um, and we can talk more about that. Cause I think there's a real spectrum in the reseller community, particularly on Instagram mm -hmm. of people who resell because they just truly want to rehome vintage and they're, they're not interested in the business side of it. Um, and then kind of the other, the other end of the spectrum where people are fully focused, um, as a business and there are a lot of people in between. So, yep, it really is a spectrum. Okay. So you're in Abu Dhabi, then you end up back in the United States yeah, so and you, you're back. kind of a, a dual state citizen too. Let's talk about Illinois versus yeah. Washington, DC, all the places. Yeah. So, well, when I came back with my husband, he left the military. We came back to DC um, to my, what was my single girl condo in downtown DC. I'm like the most unlikeliest thrifter ever. I have a full-time job. I live in an urban area. I have porch pirates. So I can't like, I can't like leave stuff out and have people pick it up. You know, um, I live uh, now with my husband and my dog and 800 square feet with a very small storage unit. So, but I'm making it work, but yeah, so we came back, um, and, uh, came back in October and took the class with Kelly, um, as soon as I got back and started that pick and pixie in January of 2023. So about a year and a half ago. And, uh, yeah, because I now am remote, I've had the ability to kind of my parents, my mother is in, um, Southern Illinois, just kind of suburban St. Louis, uh, like 30 minutes from the arch. And so I do spend time here a little more than I used to because I can work remotely. And so it's been very interesting seeing the different styles and mm -hmm. sourcing, um, styles and prices of sourcing between huh. the mid Atlantic in DC and the East coast and then Southern Illinois kind of in the true heartland. So that's um, it, it's, it's a really, for me, it's a benefit. I feel like it's a benefit for my customers because I can really access a wide variety of styles. And mm -hmm. you said in the bio, I'm style agnostic. I'm not somebody who does just glass or just brass or just, um, you know, mid mod, I'm uh, that probably, I would probably be more profitable if I focused on a niche, mm -hmm. but, um, this is, it's a business, but it's also my creative pleasure hobby. So to keep myself happy and interested, I like to source everything from farmhouse to, you know, fine China. So, um, yeah, but I am kind of, um, uh, I'm going to say by, by state, I guess, if you will. <laughs> and, and which ones, but well, I don't even know if you want to say which one's better. Give us like a kind of a description of each and how they differ. So in the mid Atlantic, and when I say the mid Atlantic, um, I'm talking, I'll just say DC, right? Cause it's an urban East coast Metro area. Um, if you get out of DC within 30 minutes, you're in some pretty rural areas, particularly, yeah. um, you can go up to Pennsylvania, Delaware, rural Maryland, rural Virginia, and there's some really amazing, um, thrifting, uh, Richmond, Virginia, in particular, Ooh. Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, if you kind of get out of the city, there's some really cool places, Pennsylvania, uh, has a ton of um, that Amish really country. Well yeah. the Amish country. They've got a little, a lot of mid-century stuff you can find there. Mm -hmm. um, but in DC, kind of proper in the immediate suburbs, um, the houses are typically more traditional, traditionally furnished. Um, a lot of higher end, I would say, you know, people have, you know, are, uh, tend to be affluent. There's some very affluent suburbs, I should say, right in the, right outside of DC. 
um, where you find a lot of higher priced goods. So a lot of estate sales you go to, if you're going to think you're getting like a bargain, like you would at a yard sale, you're not going to find it at a lot of the the close-in suburbs in Washington, D.C. There's also um, a lot of federal style. And, you know, I laugh because I say every estate sale you go into in D.C. or the immediate suburbs, um, you will find that same mirror that's like the gold mirror with the eagle on top. <laughs> I love that you refer to it as federal style. That's, that's a funny, I'm going to use that phrase. Every federal single time style. you will find that one, <laughs> that mirror with the freaking eagle on it. That's funny. Um, and you know what? It always sells, not to me, but to someone. <laughs> um, and, you know, and then you find a lot of, you know, a lot of ton of Waterford, a lot of fine China. What I find interesting in the D.C. area is you also have a lot of, um, you know, people like us who've been in milit in the military. Mm-hmm. They've been stationed around the world. Um, you have the diplomatic corps there. So a lot of kind of world travel treasures that are not your typical, you know, I bought this t-shirt in Korea kind of thing. I mean, if you, Mm -hmm. especially if you're someone who's really focused on a particular region, um, whether it's, you know, African or whether it's Middle Eastern, when you find like the real deal stuff, not tourist things, people that, you know, furnishings, rugs, art that people bought while they were either stationed in the military or stationed with the state department, and a lot of the estate sales in particular in DC, and, and you find it at thrifts for sure. Um, you know, I've found some really interesting pieces in the DC Goodwill, which isn't known for having great thrifting, but interesting. You really okay. hit some interesting international pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, for estate sales, a lot of times in the description for the estate sales, they will say um, just recently there was. I guess a very, I I had to ask my brother-in-law who was a Marine, like, who is this guy? He sounds important, you know? And it was the estate of like a top, top Marine uh, that had passed and the amount of memorabilia that he Mm -hmm. had and the amount of gifts that he was presented from other like leaders of other countries. um, You know, it was pretty amazing. So a lot of times you will see in the estate sale descriptions, they will say, you know, a uh, former state department mm. or diplomat or four, you know, three-star general or whatever. And so that's, I think that's very unique mm-hmm. to DC. Um, in the Midwest, I, I find it's just a little more homespun, which is great. Now what I love, and I grew up in the Midwest. So what's great about sourcing and thrifting in the Midwest is everybody has a basement mm-hmm. and, um, Midwestern people, particularly the generation that we're thrifting from, right? Like our grandparents' generation, mm-hmm. um, they save everything and they save it in the original box. And yes. Anyone who follows me on that <gasps> pick and pixie knows, like, I'm slightly obsessed. Yesterday, I I I thrifted at the Goodwill. Uh, so we don't have our here, you know, but um, thrifted at the Goodwill, a box of Swedish angel chime candles. So these oh like random little made in Sweden candles. Um, and I really did it just for the box. <laughs> <laughs> and they keep the boxes in like mint condition. Yeah. People get yeah. very mad. I mean, the here. original packaging. Yes. And what I love to find my favorite is when you find an origin story, you find mm. like the, the, I had, um, you know, I've found wedding cards from the 1950s that they've kept with the wedding gift that they've probably never used (laughs) because it was quote too nice. You know, um, I found birthday cards, you know, uh, just, I think it's so fun when you find the origin story of, of things like that. And I, I tend to find that more in the Midwest because I do think people are savers and, um, you know, and they have, again, they have the storage space, um, where, you know, you go down South, my cousins live in Memphis. They don't have basements. Yeah. I don't know what it's like in Colorado, if you all have. We have basements in Colorado, but I'm originally from California where there's no basements. So it it was a real change to come here and be like, oh, I've got all this space. What do you do? You fill it up. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and my gosh, when I go to estate sales in um, the Midwest in particular, I hit the basements first. I used to do the kitchens hmm. first because I was like, I'm going to get the Pyrex. 
but everybody runs to the kitchen first or n- maybe not runs, but just naturally migrates to a kitchen. Like you do sure. anytime you go into someone's yeah. home. And so I've started going, um, either into the boudoir, um, where there's some cool things on the dressers usually in the basements mm, because good that's advice. Where you can really hit it. Yeah. Um, hit the basements, hit the basements, especially if you like holiday. That's where everybody keeps all their holidays, all their Christmas stuff. So what kind of thrifting are you seeing in Illinois? Um, Can you shout out any of your favorite stores there that we need to put on our list when we're making our summer plans? Yeah. So there are, um, so what's interesting. So we're in Southern Illinois or my parents are in Southern Illinois and uh, I-55 runs from Chicago to St. Louis. Oh, so you get that whole. And there is, yeah. And there's a really strong um, vintage and resell and antique game that goes up and down I-55. In fact, when you go into these stores along I-55, they have the pamphlet with the, the map to show you where you can, you can literally, and even if you don't want to go that far, um, Springfield, Illinois, the capital of Illinois is like 90 minutes from St. Louis. And mm-hmm. even between Springfield, Illinois and St. Louis, if you go up I-55, there are, you know, three or four kind of well-known, um, shops and then continuing up to Chicago, um, in particular. So, uh, there's one that's really fun. Um, it's about 30 minutes from here called the pink elephant. Mm. And anybody who's drive, if anybody who's driven down 55 from Chicago to St. Louis or to Memphis or wherever, they've, they've seen the pink elephant because they literally have this giant, like circus size promo pink elephant. And it's How cool. I love this. It's roadside and it's huge. And, um, they have, you know, like the old fashioned ice cream. And in fact, it's been purchased by a couple uh, within the last year or two. And I've read that they're looking to make it into like an Airbnb, like have campers there. So it's a a super fun vibe. My, my stepbrother would take, um, his son, my nephew, when he was little up there because they had ice cream Mm -hmm. and it was just like, um, an easy kind of entertainment, let him pick a toy, that kind of thing. It was an easy drive. Um, so that's a fun one. Um, and there's another place right outside of St. Louis called the Chirping Frog in this tiny, tiny town called Warden, W-O-R-D-E-N, Illinois. And the Chirping Frog is good. So you can hit the Chirping Frog and the Pink Elephant. I love these names. (laughs) And that can be your whole day. And, um, and the prices are reasonable. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, there's another, there are a couple pickers markets that are really popular in mm-hmm. Southern Illinois. One's called the Litchfield Pickers Market. Um, so there, there are definitely different areas. And then we we have the chains too. You know, we have uh, the Goodwill. It's part of the Goodwill of Greater St. Louis, whatever, mm-hmm. Metro St. Louis, whatever it's called. Um, there's a restore, Habitat for Humanity, Um Salvation Army, you know, kind of your general chains. Um, and as you know, Maggie, those just vary. You never know what you're going to get. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but that's kind of where those are my major thrifting areas. You know, I'm kind of funny. I don't, um, I don't have that. Some people are really secretive about where they go. They gatekeep. Yes. And, um, you know, it's their honey hole. And so, the first time there's a, somebody recommended a place to me. And I think these are interesting if you're looking to thrift also, and b- beyond kind of the general thrift stores, uh, there's a company locally here that is an estate clear out company. That's, that's how they make their money. And then they have this warehouse that's open Thursday through Sunday and anything that they've taken from the estates, they just put in this warehouse. And I mean, it doesn't have heat. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so like you have to bundle up when you go in the winter. <laughs> um, it is not like, you know, it's like shopping in a warehouse. It's mm-hmm. not anything, um, you know, nothing is organized very well. Um, it's just kind of there and you have to dig through things. Um and, and by the way, it's called the Marine Flea Market because I, I don't, I'm not a secret keeper. So <laughs> Marine Flea Market in Marine, Illinois, but the, the guy that owns it, when I first was getting to know him, he told me they had a really hard time marketing 
Hmm. when they started their business because people would not tell other people where they were getting this. Word of mouth is critical. Yeah. And because the thrifters were going in and like, I don't want to give up my honey hole. This company was having a really hard time getting the word out that they oh. had this this side business, and so yeah, so I'm I'm kind of um, I I will say when I started out, I thought, oh, you're not supposed to tell anybody where you get your stuff, mm-hmm. and I mean, there is so much vintage and to go around, yeah, out there for for generations, you <laughs> literally, yep. There is so much that um, not one person could ever possibly mm-hmm. run out yep. um, of thrifting opportunities. And so um, I, and, and I think that's really what's great about the reseller community on Instagram in particular. Um, people tend to be, um, people tend to share Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, they want others to be successful because once you do start thrifting or as you work for a, a major, um, thrift chain, you know, that, uh, th- there's no way you're ever going to run out of options. Oh, that's the best. That's inspirational. What you just said right there. And our listeners need to hear that because some people do believe that, you know, we're running out of the good stuff. We're definitely not. No. It's all, there's always something, always something new. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's, that's I, why you, I hear people say a lot, oh, I go every day to the thrift store. I go three times a day and I wish I could be that person. I'm not because I, I work four days a week. Yes. This, another job, uh, pros and cons to being a part-time thrifter. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk but, about that because yeah. I think your day job does kind of tie in nicely to what you're doing. And, you know, I, I mean, I see you as an ally for our reselling community, what you're doing um, in terms of fighting for regulation. So can you share with us kind of a little bit more about your day job? Yeah, sure. So I am a lobbyist, a federal lobbyist in Washington, D.C. And our organization um represents printing and packaging manufacturers. So that's probably one reason why I have a little obsession with the the printed box and the old printed in the USA boxes. Um, I I do love all the design and the graphics and the fonts and all of that. Um, But what I do for the industry is I advocate on Capitol Hill for an environment that makes the business, um, makes the business environment um, more rewarding and successful for those companies and their employees. And so as part of that, we have a variety of issues that I've lobbied on over the years. And one that most people don't even think that people in Washington are working on because it's, it's really arcane and, and kind of boring, frankly, is postal rates and regulations. Mm -hmm. And, um, Interestingly, as a reseller, I'm it like, affects our community. Yes, huge, huge. And so I have for years, um, you know, worked on this issue and people probably also don't realize that there are companies that are lobbying Congress and advocating for resellers. Uh, eBay, for example, has a really well-established um, lobbying arm and they're not like lobbying people. Oh, eBay, they're just, you know, trying to you know, make as much money as they can. Well, yeah, they're a for-profit business, but they're, they're advocating on behalf of their resellers. And in fact, eBay brings groups of small business sellers Mm -hmm. that sell on their platform. They bring them to Washington, DC to connect them with their members of Congress so that members in Congress understand that when eBay is, you know, talking about a particular regulation and how it affects them, it's not just the company, it's Mm -hmm. how it affects millions of small resellers on their platform. And so, yeah, so postal issues are really huge. Um, Another company that I've worked with in the past is um, a company I use as a reseller for my my shipping management, and that is Pirate Ship. You Mm -hmm. hear a lot of people talk about Pirate Ship um, on Instagram in particular. Uh, There are other companies that do this, do the same thing, but it's just um, a postal management system. Um, so pirate ship has been doing the same thing. They advocate for postal rates that are affordable and predictable. And we, you know, prices of everything go up. We know that, you know, it's, it's just the cost of cost of living continues to rise and the consumer price index is always going up. Um, but there is a point where if you raise postal rates too much, you really dramatically 
impact the volume and people just say, forget it. I'm not doing it anymore. And for resellers, you know, it, it, that may cause a reseller to say, I'm just going to do um, a booth at an antique store. Yeah. It becomes is, a tipping point. Yeah. Yeah. It is a tipping point. And, you know, we've got a, um, a, another kind of impact coming July 1st. So the postal service uh, is raising rates. So starting July 1st, uh, rates and I think all classes or most classes of mail that I use anyway as a reseller are going up in some in some cases significantly. And so people need to pay attention to that. And if you haven't, go to usps.gov. You can see the rates. Um, they're they're transparent about what they're going to be. But you know, if it's as a reseller, you need to think about that. And I I tend to hear resellers when they talk about shipping, I must talk about it in in a guilty or an apologetic Mm -hmm. way. Uh, And, you know, I always think like, yeah, it's great to get, or, or or buyers too, for that matter, you know, buyers are, well, can't you give me a break on shipping or can you, you know, but look, we don't set the postal rates. (laughs) There are groups like eBay or the printing industry or pirate ship who are trying to influence, you know, laws and regulations so that the prices don't get so out of control that it makes it difficult for smaller resellers and businesses to operate. But the reality is, you know, as a reseller, as an individual, don't feel guilty or feel like you have to apologize because the shipping rates are going up. You know, yep. I mean, it's just a matter of doing business and, and candidly, I will be adjusting my shipping rates. Mm-hmm. I, I tend to do um, just a flat rate shipping because I like to keep it simple. Um, and I'll have to be looking at, you know, my numbers and what the rates are and what the new weight classes are and all of that. And it's just kind of a business decision. Um, But I think if we normalize the fact that everybody's operating under the same rules and the same rates, um, then maybe have a better understanding that, you know, we're we're all, you know, we're all kind of beholden to what those rates are. We don't set those individual rates. And so while we can set our own shipping rates and have our own business models, we're all facing the same exact cost Mm -hmm. pressure. Yep. And this is the cost of doing business. Now, on that same sort of note, and thank you for doing that. And I think everyone listening to this podcast is going, thank goodness, there's someone in our world that's lobbying for the things that truly are affecting our businesses. Now, you are also platform agnostic. You sell on several different platforms. Talk about those, like your favorite um, and Kind of your advice as a part-time reseller, I feel like sometimes people listen to this podcast, they're new to this world, like your advice on a, on a good starting platform. So, yeah, and it's an interesting question because I would say I my love-hate relationship with platforms mm-hmm. is ever-changing <laughs> because the platforms are ever-changing. Yes. So when I first started, um, I, okay, so we all hate fees. We all hate added fees. Let's just start their baseline. So if you're selling on Instagram or now, believe it or not, I am in my fifties. So I know this isn't cool. Facebook, and I'll talk about Facebook in a minute. Cause I think it's really overlooked. Um, but if you're selling on Instagram or Facebook, you're selling direct, and you, uh, it's amazing what that 20% or that 30% that's taken out by platforms, um, how that adds up. And so you're really able to bring a better price to your customer and you're, you know, you're able to create the, the best margin for yourself in the same way. So that to me is, is ideal. Um, however, it takes, a long time to build up a customer base. And it takes a lot of effort and work and time to build a customer base on Instagram and on Facebook. And I still remember like the first month or two I was selling on Instagram and nothing was selling. And I thought, oh, well, my prices are too high. So I reached out to my mentor, um, Kelly at Part-Time Pickers. And I said, do you think I need to lower my prices because no one's buying anything? And she said, No, your prices don't do it. Well, she said, your prices are fine. Your problem is no one knows you exist. Mm. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, that's great. You could have the best stuff in the world. You could have the best inventory at the world at the best prices. And if 
if 10 people are following you on Instagram, there's 10 people that know that you're selling that, you know, yeah. so it is a numbers game. So, so the, the pro of selling direct on Instagram or Facebook, and I'm not even talking about marketplace because I've done that once, but, um, just having your own Facebook page, um, the pros are meta business is actually pretty good with its analytics. And mm -hmm. so you definitely want to be a business account on Instagram and Facebook. So you get access to meta analytics. It will tell you things like, um, Reach, the age range, yeah. yep. um, what time the peak times where your followers are online, um, so there's a lot you can, you can get by that. Plus you don't have the fees. Now the downside is, and I have, this is so out of my world, but the algorithms, right? Like everybody talks about the algorithm change and move and yikes. And there are people who are online. It's like, I'm an algorithm expert. I can tell you, uh, how to do that, you know, and I don't know that anybody's, and I don't no. even know people who work at meta are algorithm experts because it's so random. At least it appears to be that way from mm -hmm. a non- technical non-IT point of view. So you do have to, you're kind of operating at the whim of that. And I mean, I see stuff on my own Instagram site where I'm like, wait a minute, like two weeks ago I had, you know, my engagement was super high and, you know, two weeks later, my engagement is super low. Could be my products, could be, you know, I'm not posting, you know, in the right way, or it could just be the algorithm. So mm -hmm. So for that reason, I do, especially as a, a new reseller, and I'm only a year and a half, so really doing this as a business. So I do consider myself still new. I do, I do highly recommend being on other platforms. Mm -hmm. um, if if your goal is to actually move product and right? make and, this a full time job eventually, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good advice. And, good advice. Yeah. So, um, and I think people, it's interesting because people have kind of, I think there's some stigma. Um, I think there's a stigma with eBay and I kind of subscribe to that for a while. I'm like, oh, eBay is kind of, you know, it's impersonal. It's, um, you know, there's everything on there. You can buy like adult diapers or you can buy, you know, a priceless Pyrex. I mean, it's just kind of, um, it's not cool or hip, right? But I've kind of gone back to eBay recently. Interesting. Okay. I've been making some really good sales on eBay. And the, one of the reasons is I think particularly if you have a certain brand, whether it's Pyrex or whether it's Heron's Animals, I just did like three Heron Animals that I found out were broken. And if you know what the Heron Animals are, they're those beautiful fishnet painted with with real gold and these gorgeous animal figures. And I was so excited. I scored these great ones at an estate sale. And I went and I realized they were a great price because I hadn't read the description fully Oh, in my excitement. And they all had like the horse had a broken leg Chips, and the, yeah. the stork, you know, had a broken beak or whatever. And they'd been glued back together. And I thought, Oh man, I can't sell these to my customers. Cause I really do value quality and I don't want to dilute that. Um, I'll put them on eBay, you know, maybe send, but, and I said on eBay, here's the deal. These are broken. As is, yeah. Some people want to repair these. That's great. Within minutes, these sold minutes. Wow. And I realized it's because people that are true collectors of Heron or certain types of Pyrex or whatever, they have their searches set to get a notification when, someone when something comes up. So that is the benefit. We have a lot of yeah. eBay resellers on this podcast and, yeah. you know, some that are part of that lobbying, lobbying contingent, they'll go to, you know, mm -hmm. help yeah. out with things. Um, and you're, you're right though. It's this ebb and flow. Sometimes they're in good favor with the resellers. Sometimes they're out. Yeah. It's all about these changing platform costs and prices. Um, yeah. And I'm really down on Etsy. Like I'll just be on, I, I, I and, yeah. you know, I, if I tick off the Etsy people, I'm sorry, but, um, well, maybe I, they'll I hear really, it and make a change, you know, Yeah, because it, especially with posted rates going up, I think Etsy really needs to look at the way they're very, very skewed to buyers. Um, now I just sold, um, two things on Etsy this week at a much higher price than I would have allowed somebody to buy it. Yeah. I would, somebody could have got a much better deal from me directly because Etsy is skewed so that as the reseller, if you're selling anything over like $32, they want you to pay for the shipping. Wow. So you have to yeah. build not only the Etsy fee 
and these like crazy ad fees they have now on Etsy. Um, you also have to pay for the shipping. And so I, that is kind of my last resort is Etsy. And like I said, people still buy it. And I, I feel frustrated. I want to tell them like, you're paying too much. Yeah. Um, because if you bought this on eBay and you were willing to pay the shipping, you know, a reasonable shipping rate for it or Poshmark. And the reason I like Poshmark is because of the shipping rate. It's mm-hmm. super straightforward. It's low yeah. cost. They're like very eight, transparent. They're known for dollars or something. Yeah. yeah. Now the bad thing about what resellers and I've been caught up in this on Poshmark. So anyway, so yeah, so Etsy, I'm kind of down on Etsy. Poshmark, I do like, even though I still think it's still better for clothing and bags because mm-hmm. that's how it was originally, you know, started, but they do have, they have a fairly robust home section and I do sell things, you know, weekly mm-hmm. on Poshmark. Um, but I did make the mistake of selling, and this is a good story of why you should talk to your customers. I had a full set of, uh, Pyrex casseroles. So like the three set casserole Pyrex with the lids, those are pretty heavy. Um, so I sold them on Poshmark, but they were above five pounds and Poshmark starts dinging you as the, well, I shouldn't say they ding you. So the way Poshmark is set up, right? The buyer pays the shipping. But if it's over five pounds, the seller has to purchase additional. You're kidding. I didn't know that. Interesting. A lot of people don't know that. And and that's why it's really important to dig in to the business models of these platforms. Now, I'm not an expert because they do change all the time. But, you know, I try to stay abreast on what's happening. And what's interesting is I thought, I'm just not doing it. I, I, I'm probably a year or two, a year ago, I would have thought, oh, I have to just take a loss and, and sell this and pay for all the, the, it's like $25 to ship Pyrex, right? And so a big set like that. And I thought I would just have taken the loss and, you know, moved on. But the current me said, you know what, I'm not doing that. And so I reached out to that, canceled the sale. I reached out to the customer by message and I said, I'm really sorry. I didn't realize that I was going to have to pay additional shipping. And this, you know, I, this actually takes away all of my profit. I'm, I'm actually losing money selling this to you. <laughs> um, so that's why I canceled the sale and I apologize. And this is, this is you know due to Poshmark shipping practices. Yeah. Well, the customer wrote me back and she said, I have been really looking for this everywhere. I really, really want it. Could you relist it and just add, you know, 25. She was willing to pay it. Yes. Willing to pay it. And I, and I, you know, and that worked out. So yeah. had I yeah. not reached out to her or even asked, and I think that's important too. It's, it's a whole communication between open communication. Yeah. That's great advice too. If you're new to this, create yeah. a relationship. Yeah. This and, is and, fascinating. I love don't how ghost much... people don't ghost. Yeah. That's what people hate more than anything being ghosted. Yep. All right. I've got to ask you and we're running up on our time, but yeah. trad life, trad wife. I'm obsessed with this concept. I listened to this podcast, shout out our girls from the morning toast and Jackie O is very into being a trad wife these days. Tell us about this. We have never talked about it on this podcast. Short for traditional. It's a trend though, and it's all over TikTok too. It's going crazy. Tell us a little bit about it. It is. And I should start by saying I'm not one. (laughs) Even though you look so fancy. Uh, Yeah. No, I work my butt off. Um, I I work in a pretty intense job with with work travel and everything four days a week, but I did negotiate um, having having Friday off. I was a trad wife for like three months during my sabbatical. I'm not going to lie. It's pretty nice. Um, Making the sourdough and everything, the sourdough starter. Yeah. So I mean, but I think that, um, you know, the whole trad life, trad wife, I, I, I can't really speak to that specifically other than I think it's intriguing and I think it's kind of freaky in some ways. Oh my God, that young people are finding this is so bizarre to me. What's really weird is trad girlfriend and I did or trad, trad something like that because I guess an article in the New York times, I think about women who are like, oh, this might've been a mistake because I haven't worked and I just broke up with my boyfriend and and now what am I going to do? Oh my Lord. You know? So, I mean, Ugh, you know, ladies. Be, be wary of the trends out there, girls. Be wary. Yes. I'm not saying everybody has to be a career woman. I mean, it's worked for me. Um, but, 
you know, everybody has their own path, but I will say the trad wife kind of also comes from the, the, there's a whole movement on from decor and traditional and grand millennial decor. And we kind of talked about that earlier. Um, and I just, it's by personally, I, I like it. It's my taste. A lot of what I, I have a pretty eclectic taste. Um, but I do find that people that's becoming more popular mm -hmm. on Instagram for a while. Everything was mid mod, mid mod. Yes. And, um, you know, Viking glass and everything that was, you know, from the 1950s and 1960s. And I'm seeing, and maybe I'm just seeing them more, maybe they've always been there, but I'm seeing, um, kind of a, a rise in Instagram shops in particular that, have um are focusing just on kind of the grand millennial and i actually yeah. just heard somebody or i read um a really fabulous reseller that i follow and i'm i'm happy to to name names so nessa she's great out of kansas with um mid century monarch and she posted something recently and i'm paraphrasing here that um that she was starting to get more requests or starting to sell more grand millennial and she, yeah, it's her brand has always been mid mod. So mm -hmm. I think that, um, there is kind of, you know, different trends out there. And I think that's, what's really important. And, um, again, kind of going back to the platforms, like I sell on cherish also, which is one that a lot of people aren't as familiar yeah, with. Yeah. I don't think I I've sell. ever heard of it. Yeah. It's, it's a higher end. Like it started with furniture, um, and so I've sold a couple pieces. I, I rarely source furniture, but if I do, I sell it on something Cherish. fabulous. Yeah. And they have local pickup, which is that, that helps with the shipping and they're a little bit more commission, but higher priced. Check it out. If you do high end things, check out cherish.com. They're out of San Francisco and it's like chair, like C H A I R I S H. Oh, cute. Um, okay. Yeah. So Cherish, but, um, Cherish has a seller's guide. I think, okay. you know, Etsy does these too. And these are corporations. Now, Cherish is, I think, smaller. Etsy is a big corporation. Poshmark is a big corporation. And they all produce kind of trend guides for their sellers and seasonal guides. And, you know, it is, we've all got a lot of email. We've all got a lot going on, particularly if you're like me and, and you work and you do this part-time but I think it is important to pay attention to trends. I mm -hmm. mean, you can see them on TikTok or Instagram. Um, but I think, you know, take advantage of the fact that they're these platforms, you're paying fees, right? To these platforms, part of what you're getting as they have a staff of people who are putting together analytics and reports and trends and, you know, just even skimming those um, can really help. That's great advice. They, really they should be a resource. Yeah. Focus. Yeah. That's what I see a big mistake I see people making, and I, you know, we all do this when we start out is sourcing something that you think is so wonderful that you're going to convince other people that doesn't so happen. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And it just doesn't happen. So, I mean, you know, give the people what they want and yeah. find out what they want by following kind of these, these trends, whether it's the trad life, trad wife or grand millennial or mid mod or farmhouse or whatever, Great whatever advice. it happens to be. All right. So speaking of that, the unicorn item, can you tell us a story of like uh, the best thing you've ever found and resold or kept? Yeah, probably. <laughs> kept. <laughs> so I do it's have usually this category. Kept. <laughs> I have this sort of like personal inventory category. And I bet mm. a lot of other resellers do too. We're like, if this doesn't sell, I won't be sad category is kind of what I have. My husband does not think that's a great business model, but you know, that's just how I am. So I, I, uh, my mother has always had the Spode Christmas China. It's the Christmas tree Ooh, China. So we've always eaten on that. You know, my niece and nephew have grown up, you know, we, we have all the different pieces. We probably have way too much of it. Um, but like my sister-in-law and I always like, you know, someday this will be ours and we'll continue the tradition. And my mom, in fact, is at that age where she's like, do not buy me another piece of yeah. Christmas tree, you know? And then I said, mother, we're also buying this for ourselves. We're yeah. giving it to you as a gift, but we want this. Cause we day. know we're going to get it one day. <laughs> we like it. And so, um, so I always kind of, you know, I, I, I gravitate towards this kind of nostalgia. So I went to this estate sale locally and I, I went to the basement, 
right? Where all the holiday stuff was. I have never, this, this was an excessive, I can't imagine how the, why these people had so much stuff in their house. I mean, it was like a high end hoarder house and they had floor to ceiling shelves that were like as big as my bathroom in my DC condo of all this box spode Christmas tree. Wow. And there was a couple, an older man and woman who were, I mean, they had, they did a whole buyout of it. And they were just packing it up and they must've had a booth or an antique shop or something, something yeah. that they were going to resell this. Right. So I was like, Oh, well, that's kind of interesting. And I'm not getting in their way. Cause they, they told me as soon as they went down there, we've already purchased all of this. We're just taking it up. Okay. So I went upstairs. Well, upstairs were two pieces of spade that I guess were like, just, they hadn't taken downstairs or didn't fit in the shelves. And, um, I had never seen them before. They're so, so hard to find. I'm looking at one right now because I do have it online. Um, I keep one for myself. They are lamps. They are ginger jars, Interesting. Christmas Day porcelain lamps. Oh, amazing. Uh, there are very few comps online. They're like $300. If you look online and I got each one for 1750. Oh, you've got to keep those forever. But the real story is apparently the people had already bought these, right? Because they oh. made a deal we're buying all this food. But the upstairs estate sale workers had not talked to the downstairs estate sale workers. So the upstairs people sold them to me. And then there was this like, well, now we've sold them to two. We've sold them to two buyers. Yeah. And I, I stood my ground. I thought, look, they're getting hundreds of pieces of this. And I think they finally just gave up and they they Finally, the worker came upstairs and he said, they said, you could take them. I said, well, yeah, thank you very much. And I walked out with my two $17, and 50 cent lamps and a and story I'll, to go with it. Yes. And they're two. So I can share them with my sister-in-law. Nice. And then I'll just close by saying, never, like, never think that you're not going to find something at a thrift because people get, you said that people get down on thrifts. They, they, you know, are mad at thrift store prices mm -hmm. are too high. You never find anything. There's just junk. There are too many thrifters out there. Um, I walked into the Goodwill on Wednesday here in Southern Illinois, where you don't really find people serving oysters at home very much. And I sourced an antique oyster plate. I've never wow. found one in the wild. And, um, you know, again, these are very, you know, these are European, these are antiques and it was a like, stop the, you know, start the car moment. <laughs> Let's and, get out of here uh, quick. I, I did list it. I did list it because uh, people who like really know oyster plates will appreciate it. But yeah, so I, I am like, I just keep the faith. That's what I always tell people. Mm -hmm. I did a reel on it after I came home with the oyster plate. I'm like, look, I went yesterday and I came home with one mug Yeah. and I went today and I came home with a bin full of things, including this priceless to me oyster plate. So keep I love the faith. it. Keep, Keep the, the faith, faith that you may have just named your episode. I love that. <laughs> All right. Before we get into Dolly Parton, I do want to know just because you are doing so many interesting things and kind of diversifying really well, what's next? What's next? Yeah. So I am, um, in terms of what's next for me, I am, you know, for me, it's continuing to learn and part of what I like to do. And I, I don't know who wants to hear it, but I feel like somebody out there wants to hear it. I love to learn the origin story of a brand or what years a particular pattern was produced. And so um, I, I started out doing some reels. I did one on milk glass and I had so many people say, thank you. I never really knew like the origin of milk glass. Yeah. Right? It's ubiquitous. You see it all the time. Nobody really thinks about it or particular Pyrex patterns, like what year they were made um, you know, and, and specific, what to look for specifically, um, on certain patterns. So I would like to do more of that kind of those educational content awesome. reels and videos, because to me it's, it's, you know, I would like to just share knowledge as well as just hawk my wares. You yeah, know? It's, yeah. it's more meaningful to me that way. So I'd like to do more of those. And, um, I've kind of got, also gotten into some curated drops where, um, you know, I, I just put one together that I'll be releasing soon that's uh, made in Italy. Um, and it's not like I particularly went out and sourced things that were made in Italy. Yeah. I just realized like, oh, I have six things that were made in Italy. And rather than post them one at a time, kind of slap shot, like I particularly like shopping a curated mm -hmm. 
um, a curated line. So I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do it weekly. It's hard as a, you know, part-timer, but, um, you know, doing some, some drops like that so that people can focus a little bit and particularly on Facebook, um, I'm starting in July doing a specific time and day, um, so that my Facebook followers know, um, you know, and I and haven't decided money. yet when that is, but they yeah. know I can go at a certain time and certain day and see everything she has for sale mm-hmm. because Poshmark or uh, Poshmark Facebook is a little harder to shop because of the way you have to scroll. It's not a grid like on Instagram. And mm-hmm. so, yep, just continuing to learn and continuing to educate and continuing to have fun. Really? <laughs> That's the joy. Me, this is fun. This is, I, you know, I, people say stress relief for me, it's creative relief. Mm-hmm. And that's what thrifting is for me. Amazing. Well, Lizbeth, I always say that this podcast is devoted to normalizing shopping secondhand, but if it weren't for people like you, this would stop in its track. So as always, I love to say, thank you for your service. We're so grateful. Keep it up, please. Don't stop. Thank you. Thank you for that. No, I always, we always need encouragement. It's, this can get really stressful and uh, people get down easily. So, you know, I have my ups and downs too. So thank you for that encouragement, Maggie. Yeah. Stick it out. Cause we just, we're really enjoying watching your content too. So let's keep it moving and a hundred percent. We have your back and can't wait to thank see what you. you do next. Thank you so much. Thank All you. Right. As we end every pod, love to do a shout out to our girl, one Miss Dolly Rebecca Parton. Thoughts, feelings? What would you like to say about the queen? (laughs) I love Dolly. Um, So I did, uh, you will appreciate that I came across, and it was funny because I talked earlier about this estate sale. It was an auction actually, where I bought all this heron that ended up being broken and repaired. Um, in addition to like the hundreds of dollars of Herond that I sourced, I sourced a 1970s Dolly Parton in the box Barbie doll. Love and it. she had the, um, you know, the like the flared bell bottom oh. red jumpsuit, the heels, uh, the hair. And like I, I, they, I said they must have had to make a special Barbie mold because she was anatomically correct. Oh, and wow. Much, much top heavier than the other Barbies. Interesting. And that's saying something from back yeah. in the 70s with the Barbies. So, uh, yeah. So if you are a Barbie fan or a Dolly fan and you haven't added that to your collection, like oh. go go scour the platforms and look for the Dolly Parton. It was like 1973, I think. But I'm even find the her. box was great. Yeah. Probably still in box. I love that. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Thank you for sharing that with us. I love it. when I think you should look for it, Maggie. Yeah. (laughs) Hopefully someone sends it to me or one of my stores does. Elizabeth, you're an absolute delight. Tell our listeners finally how they can reach you, reach out to you, follow you and buy from you. Best way to find you online. At that pickin' pixie. Uh, T-H-A-T. P-I-C-K-I-N, Pixie, P-I-X-I-E. And uh, yeah, and I welcome DMs too, particularly if anybody's listened to this, if they're just getting into reselling or if they think I said something that was like really off base and I need to be corrected or they have a suggestion for me on what to do better because I've only been doing this for a year and a half as a quote professional. Um, I I welcome the, um, the interaction. I love it. And guys, reach out, send her all the love, because that's really what this podcast is about, is supporting our reseller community and our thrift community. So thank you for joining us, Lizbeth. Listeners, thanks so much for tuning in once again to the Get Thrifty podcast. Reminder, save our pod, leave us a five-star review about how funny, creative, and smart we are. And if you're part of our unique thrift culture and you'd like to be on this podcast, you can always find me on Instagram at Podcast with Maggie. Reach out. I answer every single DM. And as always, you can follow ARC on Instagram at ARC Thrift and now on TikTok at ARC Thrift Stores. Thanks so much, folks. Have a wonderful week. It's the Get Thrifty Podcast. This podcast was powered by ARC Thrift Stores and edited by Avocet Communications.